I wanted to start with one of the biggest things that has been raised. And of course, folks know, folks know that this has been one of the biggest things because we're facing it day to day. Um, housing and senior services, uh, which I think are um, two of the biggest things that we're dealing with, housing especially, uh, as yesterday, um, I will say that when I dropped in my rent check, I myself was able to um, pay the full amount. My partner was not. Um, this is something that is hitting every single person um, as, we, uh, as we move forward because um, the reality is, uh, you know, this is, this is what we face day to day. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, there are whole industries that are no longer operating. There are people who um, can't make ends meet day to day. And uh, in, it, you know, even as a regular <laughs> New Yorker, I would say that, you know, even though people um, don't realize my, my, um, my income is not like super small, but at the same time, um, it is, uh, you know, taken up 50% of by rent. Right, and so if my partner, for example, wasn't able to, um, you know, pay his half because, you know, of whatever reason, right now, right now his entire industry shut down, so we have no income on his end. Um, if I was to pay his entire half, we would have no money for food. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that this is a reality for a lot of New Yorkers, uh, and myself included. And um, you know, so we're going to start with. Uh, you know, the amazing Ellen Davidson, um, staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society, who has been one of the biggest champions of housing um, that I know. And um, I know our district loves you greatly, Ellen. So thank you so much for coming. Um, Carlin Cohn, who I think is still having some difficulty with her camera, but um, Carlin is the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the Chinese American Planning Council. And then we also have Rocky Chin um, from AARP, who uh, will talk a lot about some of the senior issues that are going on. And we also have um, Melanie Wang um, with the Chinatown Tenant Union um, leader, uh, oh, sorry, with CAV, <laughs> sorry, but she, she's the Ch Chinatown Tenant Union leader uh, and organizer at CAV. And so I wanted to say, um, you know, thank you to all of you. And I also wanted to uh, invite our elected officials to stay when, because they have, um, you know, Brian is obviously uh, the Senate housing chair. So we're lucky to have him here. And also Brad and, uh, you know, uh, Gail have been very outspoken about housing and uh, property taxes for, for landlords uh, and also for making sure that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, our, our commercial tenants are also taken care of, et cetera. So I wanted to hope that you guys are able to stay. Um, and I wanted to thank um, uh, Nora as well for being able to speak on our NORCs and, and NORCs and our neighborhood houses. So thank you so much, Nora, for joining us as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, we wanted to kind of go through a little bit of some of the highlights um, uh, and that are district specific points uh, for folks. So some of the district specific points is that Governor Cuomo introduced a 90 day moratorium on evictions, not on rent, on evictions. So um, so even this morning, somebody called me and asked like, oh, so, you know, for rents, like we're, we, we're not, we're, we don't have to pay, right? There's a pause, right? And I was like, no, no, there is no pause on rent. And, um, and it's for commercial, no, no pause on commercial, no pause on residential. There's just a 90 day moratorium on evictions. Um, and so uh, we wanted to, you know, make sure that people knew that. Um, we, I introduced a series of bills that will uh, forgive rent for those who are significantly impacted by COVID-19 um, and led a budget letter with fellow members to allocate additional funding to NYCHA and ask Chair Russ to provide proper PPE to um, all NYCHA staff and uh, residents. And so we wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, those things are obviously um, some of our biggest uh, issues and we wanted to make sure that people could get the numbers for those bills and to read them as well. Um, so my staff will be putting that into the chat. Our uh, NYCHA budget letter for this year's budget, we requested $2 billion for the fiscal year 2021 to be used for emergency capital improvements. I also request an additional $1 billion for public housing outside of New York City. Um, we were very, very close in getting these funds. Ellen, you can talk a little bit about that. Um, and then um, unfortunately we did not get that funding. Um, our settlement house program budget letter, our settlement house programs were not included in the ex executive budget for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. And we are requesting 
uh, we were requesting $5 million of funding for 48 settlement houses across the state. Um, and this is something that, you know, Nora can speak to a little bit as well. Our NORCs and NORCs budget letter, we, uh, we are currently 43, well, so sorry, in our state, there are currently 43 naturally occurring retirement communities and neighborhood naturally occurring retirement communities contracted through the New York State um, Office of the Aging, which is NYSOPA, and we're asking to maintain the $8.055 million allotment for NNORCs and NORCs, as well as an additional $1 million in funding. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get the additional, but we did get to keep what we had uh, already gotten in past previous years. Um, as you know, I've been fighting for NORC since uh, I joined the assembly and we were actually able uh, two years ago to double um, the amount that NORCs and NORCs were uh, getting funded for in our budget. And we have slowly added to that little by little, but we have not yet um, achieved what we needed to, to be able to grow an even more robust network and um, system for our seniors. Um, so I just wanted to throw it to our panelists. Um, each of you, please um, take the time to introduce yourselves just a little bit, but also um, talk a little bit about some of the things that have gone on in our budget that, uh, that our district should know about. So I wanted to start with Ellen Davidson. Hi, uh, thanks. I love, I love your town halls. I just want to say I, I, I feel very uh, privileged to be invited. Uh, so thank you. Um, so uh, it is really hard to get housing money in the budget. Um, uh, and I want to say that in sort of thinking forward because um, I hear a lot about uh, like hopes that we're going to get money for state uh, states and localities from the federal government that will come into our state. Um, I have fears that if the money isn't directed to housing, um, it will go to other important things like schools and healthcare. Um, and so uh, I just want to have people thinking about the fact that in order to ensure uh, that we get housing money, it has to be strictly targeted to housing money. But the two things that we at Legal Aid were fighting for most in the budget for housing were uh, money for public housing. Um, and uh, we've been doing this for a long time. And this was as close as we got. Um, it really looked like, um, as we are watching other of our priorities fall off the table, um, for the first time, it looked like we were going to get a, not only money in the budget, but also uh, a, a plan for a five-year plan so there would be money in the budget for the next five years, which is incredibly important. Um, and then COVID-19 hit, um, and it was gone. Um, the second uh, thing that we were fighting strongly for in the budget that also disappeared uh, was money for homeless New Yorkers, uh, money that would uh, allow homeless New Yorkers to have a path to permanent housing. Um, I think it's very, very clear uh, more than ever that housing is healthcare um, and that, um, you know, I, the, there's been a lot in the news about canceling rent and rent strikes, which is really important. Um, how, I'm, we're part of Housing Justice for All, as is CAV. If you look at our agenda, it is, it is more than just talking about renters. We talk um, and we speak about the issues of homeless New Yorkers uh, an awful lot in our agenda. Uh, some of this has gotten, I think, hidden by uh, people being excited about rent strikes, about how important it is for us to figure out through this crisis how we get to a place where, first of all, homeless people are out of the congregate shelters where they're getting sick and dying um, into hotels and having FEMA pay for them, but also having um, the ability for uh, homeless New Yorkers to get vouchers, which would allow them to move into permanent housing. Um, and then the last thing I'll say before I move on is, um, I, because this is important for your district, is that there's also a federal moratorium that is slightly different for people who live in public housing, people who live in project-based section eight, and people who have vouchers. First of all, if you live in any of that type of housing and you've lost income, please go and get your rent uh, readjusted immediately. Um, uh, I, I can't promise you the systems are set up. Project-based section eight 
Um, there are a lot of rules about how people should be able to get their interim adjustments done immediately. There, the federal moratorium for those types of buildings is actually a month more. It's to, into the middle of July and nobody can be uh, brought to court for rent that was owed during this period without an additional 30 day notice. And the third thing I wanna say, which I think um, the federal government did well, which is unusual for me to say, is that if you're getting the pandemic un unemployment, which is the extra federal money, and you need an interim recertification, that money, that $600 a week will be blind. They will not consider it when setting your rent because it's a temporary, it's only temporary. Um, so please, please uh, go and get your rents readjusted um, and, and don't worry on June 20th, if the governor lifts the moratorium, you should be looking to the feds that are a little bit more protective of you. Okay, and I wanted to bring up uh, Rocky next. Thank you. Can you hear me? Great. <clears throat> well, thank you again, Yulene. And I, I know this is a long session, but I want to thank all the elected officials also. Um, we happen to be also celebrating the Asian Pacific Heritage Month. So I want to, uh, <laughs> it's a very, very difficult time. But I did want to say that um, although I'm wearing the senior hat today, uh, I also am a member of the Human Rights Commission. And as Julene said, there's been a really disturbing uh, documentation of increase of anti-Asian violence. And so I don't want to get into this in my particular presentation, but I want people to know that the Human Rights Commission and a lot of partners in the community are tracking this. It's really important to document it, even if you think it's minor, even if you don't, you know, even if it's not so-called legally, uh, a hate crime or even a bias harassment as per the human rights laws. Uh, and elected officials can do a lot to help spread that word. Uh, if we, it's kind of like COVID-19. If you don't track it, you don't, you know, you don't really know what the extent of it. And we're seeing this all over the country. So my concern is as we go into a <clears throat> difficult time, a lot of people are very angry. There's a lot of finger pointing and scapegoating and so forth. So this is where people start to fall into, at least uh, some people fall into bigotry and scapegoating. So um, uh, I I'm, I'm wanted to share, share a few things in terms of ARP. <clears throat> I think the main thing that I really like about your town hall and about also some of the work that Educational Alliance and other uh, settlement houses do is that you really focus on organizing the community. And this is really important in this time when we're all in this kind of digital world because we feel kind of disconnected. But this is such a critical time because a lot of things can happen with the budget. As you already mentioned, the budget is not fixed and the governor has this tremendous power and we could really have some really disastrous things. Um, but the budget is also tied to the federal government. And uh, I'm not gonna go into that depth, but ARP is very concerned about the federal budget. Um, because it's gonna impact the state. And one of those programs is the SNAP program. Um, one of the things that we found is that the, uh, there are a lot of people have SNAP in the most recent uh, stimulus has increased funding, but there are people who've maxed out already and they're not gonna get anything. And they're really the most vulnerable. And many of them have 50 plus in their households. So let's just uh, make sure we continue to, to track a lot of this stuff. Um, I wanted to just point out that we have had um, disturbing, Gail mentioned this, uh, uh, the borough president, uh, disturbing deaths in, in nursing homes. There's been a le of 11,000, over 11,000 deaths in, uh, nationally, but New York State has 2,690 deaths in nursing homes. And in Cobble Hill Health Center alone, there's been 55 deaths. It's about 15% of their entire beds um, and we're just finding more and more. So a lot of this has not been reported. The governor had issued an executive order fairly recently, but even before that, ARP was really encouraging our members and our friends to ask questions to the governor also, but also to the to these health centers. And I'm gonna go through these questions very briefly, but you can find them on the ARP website. They're very common sense, but that I, I wanna just encourage people to to um, use the phone or use email or whatever during this time. There's a 
a tendency just to kind of like veg out, you know, during this time. But, but we need to really um, make our um, nursing home officials and the oversight officials accountable. So the first question is, has anyone in the nursing home tested positive? Okay, Governor Cuomo has this executive order, but it may not be really followed. You know, you need to know the staff, have they tested positive? Have any of the people who are living in these nursing homes? Remember, they're people who go in and out of the nursing homes. They may be plumbers or they may be people who work in the kitchens. Are they being tested? And you can't just be tested once. You have to be tested every time, you know? So this is the problem right now we have with testing. There, and, and also the antibodies, as, as, as you have said, uh, assembly member, it's not perfect right now. And so we really don't know to what extent what's causing this high rate. We know there's a lot of congregation that people live in, in these nursing homes. They're elderly, they have a lot of risk factors, but until we really have a better sense of testing and protocols and so forth, we really, we really haven't gotten on top of this issue. Uh, the second is, what is the nursing home doing? That's pretty obvious. You should really demand answers. You know, don't get all this wishy-washy stuff. And by, by the way, you know, when we ask these questions and you get these answers, write it up and send it to your elected officials, send it to Governor Cuomo. We want to really know that. Um, we have uh, in ARP joined with 1199, which has a lot of healthcare workers and also the NAACP, the Urban uh, New York Urban League, uh, the Hispanic Federation, and the Asian American Federation in a call that the governor has to put together a task force to look at these long-term care. You can't just kind of like, you know, deal with all these other task forces and not deal with this particular one. And so that's something that um, ARP is trying to push forward. It's, it's not a budget issue per se, but it, you know, everything's a budget issue in some ways. It's a priority issue. Um, we also feel that a lot of the staff do, do not get the equipment they need. And you've heard this already, so I'm not gonna go over it, but you know, these are the people who are dealing day to day with, and they may be nurses, they may be just caregivers. Uh, they may be just people working in the, in the food service, in the nursing homes, but they need to be getting all that care. And if you've seen any of the, of the video coming out of, let's say some of these other countries where people are all you know, dressed up, we don't have that kind of protection still. And I'm glad we're starting to get some of that here in New York City, but, and you know, it's, it's coming kind of late. Um, so the other question, number four, is what is the nursing home doing in terms of keeping people connected to their families? Are you getting the right information? Are you um, being told, you know, like uh, if something happens, what's happening in, in real time? Um, families are very concerned. They're stressed out over what's happening. I'm gonna add a little bit here since I'm in this district and Yulene, you know, are they getting the food they want? You know, a lot of the food that we're getting now is great, but you know, it's not necessarily culturally, you know, uh, specific. And, and I'm not saying you have to have rice for everybody, but you know, I, I remember after 9-11, we got a lot of junk food and stuff like that. And, you know, we really didn't need it. So I think the, that, that's very important when we're telling, dealing with these nursing homes. Uh, and there should be a plan from the nursing home as to how they're going to communicate important information on a regular basis. Um, and finally, are they currently staffed up? You know, if they have somebody who's lost either because, to coronavirus or even just regularly sick or whatever, we need to know that. You have, you have these nursing homes that may have like, you know, 10 staff and then all of a sudden they have two staff and they haven't even know, told anybody. And we've seen the results of that. Um, the, the last thing I'm going to just mention is that, um, you know, in terms of, of, of kind of advocacy, I guess this is, this is one of the concerns that we have. Um, we need to be organized on state, local, and national levels together. I'm really happy the way that you're trying to pull together the, the city council and the state. And, and, and so ARP is doing some fairly heavy lobbying right now with the Congress. Um, as well, nationally. Uh, but I think we realize that we are in a moment in this country where we could really go one way or the other. Uh, on the one hand, we're realizing that all the things that we were, that you and other people on this call have mentioned that we, we need, you know, infrastructure for housing and, and programs for low-income people and all that, all that's becoming kind of homeless, right? 
we know that these are problems, but they've just been exacerbated by this crisis. And we have the opportunity, obviously, to say, hey, we did a step back and, and not let this crisis uh, result in just making these matters worse, which could happen. Um, but maybe we can, can really jump up and say, we need a kind of different system. We need a different, you know, a different economy. Uh, that isn't a guarantee at all. And so I want to just end with this, con this, this thought. Uh, just as the bias stuff is a concern for a lot of people, especially Asian Americans, so is the fact that black and brown, and I think other peoples of color, are dying at a very high rate. And that is so shocking. And we need to look at that as a racial disparity. So ARP has been working on recently on racial disparities in terms of the 50 plus. So I want to thank you again. I can answer questions of specifics, but the budget is so critical because you aren't physically there. You're not even in you know, his room. The governor is, can do a lot of kind of things. And same with ARP, we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we impact this process? Thank you. Thank you, Rocky. You touched on so many important things. I just wanted to um, kind of uh, just really quickly respond to one of the things that you said about the food and the nutrition. I think that, you know, we saw a lot of the boxes that were given out that was very, very, um, uh, I felt like not nutritionally uh, proficient, um, you know, and especially for seniors. Uh, I mean, if you're giving them a box of cookies, milk and applesauce, I mean, if you have diabetes, that could be a very big issue. And I think that, you know, we have to be very careful and cognizant about what um, is in those uh, meal packages. Uh, it's not, I mean, this is why, you know, um, one of the things that I was doing just for mutual aid was I worked uh, with 46 Mott Street to get um, Chinese food, healthy Chinese food that was hot for a lot of the seniors to get. Um, we were, we, we called through the district to deliver, et cetera. And I just wanted to thank, thank Gail for, again, for Fresh Direct um, services to some folks who can't get it. Um, and, you know, it, it, the nutrition uh, portion is so important. So thank you so much for touching on that piece. As well. Right. And there, and there are. And culturally appropriate food. There are a lot of great. Um, leaders in our community that are doing a lot of work with the small businesses, the restaurants, you know, in terms of providing. So that's just wonderful. Thank you, Rocky. Um, and, you know, one of the other things I wanted to mention was also, um, you know, there has been a lot of uh, discussion about the senior uh, center and the um, nursing home issues. Um, so uh, thank you so much for bringing that up as well. Uh, and I, next I'm going to, I'm kind of switching between social services and housing a little bit. And next I'm going to bring up um, Melanie uh, from uh, CAB. Hi, hello everybody. Um, I want to thank all the folks participating in the panel and our elected officials and especially you, you lean for just your like amazing moral clarity in this moment and particularly your ability to communicate with that that with the public. I really appreciate um, you know the way that you voted in the budget and how loud and clear you've been about the ways in which this pandemic is really compounding the systemic disparities we have um, in the district and then also of course in New York City and the country as a whole. Um, and my name is Melanie. I'm a tenant organizer at CAV. We at CAV organize tenants in public and in rent stabilized housing. Public housing primarily in Queensbridge houses which is outside the district of course but the largest nitrogen development um, uh, in, in the largest nitrogen development full stop so a lot of shared um, concerns with the district and then um, in the district in Chinatown uh, where I mostly work we, we organize rent stabilized Chinatown tenants um, uh, immigrant folks working class folks almost entirely people who um, do not speak English as the first language and um, I think really represent so much of what makes Chinatown Chinatown um, and as many folks have spoken to um, it has been it's been an, a really difficult time um, for the neighborhood as it has been for the whole city, but you know, um, for our neighborhood in really specific ways. Um, we are also, um, as Ellen mentioned, we're part of Housing Justice for All, which is the statewide coalition um, organizing tenants across the state, uh, uh, both to um, demand rent cancellations, to demand mortgage relief, um, for homeowners and small landlords, um, and then also to demand housing solutions for the homeless that really address, again, the systemic issues, right? Um, and um, 
uh, speak to some of what uh, Senator Kavanaugh brought up in terms of like um, transmission congregate settings and so forth. Um, we did on May 1st, tenants at 81 Bowery launched a rent strike. Um, and I just wanna see if I can, oh, have I done it? I've done it. I wanted to share the photo. Wow, this is the first time I've done this. Um, uh, we did a banner drop alongside many other tenants um, across the city and state. On the on the right, we have rent strike, and then the, I don't know which way is right left, but in Chinese it says "chu uh, xiao zhu jing," which means um, uh, cancel rent. And one thing that we're really proud of is that this image um, and reporting about the rent strike is um, on on the front page of the World Journal and Sing Tao this weekend. Um, outlets that. Um, you know, may not be known to the broader community, but which are widely read amongst the Chinese immigrant community. Um, and I, I think, you know, one of the first things I want to talk about, both specific to Chinatown, um, and then also thinking um, more broadly about Asian immigrants in the city and immigrant communities in general, is how much language access um, and, and uh, uh, issues like class um, and education and documentation are again like compounding the effects of this crisis, right? So what we're seeing on the ground, working with tenants in Chinatown, so many folks um, don't speak English that their primary news sources are Chinese language social media like WeChat, um, Chinese language papers like Sing Tao and the World Journal, um, which I will, will note do a great job of covering the city, but you know, obviously there's much less coverage than there is for your average English speaker reading the press or social media. Um, and, and then, you know, and they get information through their social networks, um, through social service providers in the neighborhood, um, like, uh, like CBC, right. And so we're seeing that there's a profound disparity, I think, between um, what English language speakers are able to access in terms of public health information, um, and uh, uh, social services information and so forth. Um, uh, and then what Chinese language speakers are able to access. And I mentioned in the chat a little bit earlier, um, one thing that is coming up constantly when I'm doing mutual aid calls, check-in calls um, with Chinatown tenants is folks saying, oh, the 90 day, 90 day thing, that's rent suspension, right? We don't have to pay rent and we'll be fine. And having to clarify that an eviction moratorium is not the same thing as a rent suspension. And they could, you know, their landlord could be bringing them to, to, to court on day one after the um, after the moratorium ends. I really, I cannot make sense of Governor Cuomo's um, repeated insistence in press conferences that uh, eviction moratorium until June is all that tenants need. It's as if he doesn't think the month of July will exist um, <laughs> or that we're all just gonna fall off a cliff at that point. Um, but uh, the fact is a lot of folks in the neighborhood, a lot of folks that I'm talking to um, because of insufficient language access and also just like confusion about the issue in general, um, think that the eviction moratorium um, is a rent suspension and it's really not. And they're not paying rent because they can't pay rent. Um, and we're really worried about what that means, you know, at the end of June and July as this moves forward. Um, then language also access is always also impacting things like um, obviously being able to apply for unemployment, right? Folks don't have the tech. They might normally um, get help from social services to do, do those kinds of paperwork and things um, and having really limited access to what is already a difficult system to access, right? We're hearing lots of stories about folks perfectly um, capable with the online tech and filling out English language paperwork and so forth, having so much trouble with unemployment. Um, and yeah, so the language access issue um, class and education issues I see really impacting how folks are able to access resources um, in this particular moment. Um, our tenant base in Chinatown is primarily home care workers, restaurant workers, construction workers. These are folks who are really, really hard hit by the economic impacts um, of, um, yeah, of, of the crisis. Um, and then the folks in our base who are not those kind of types of workers are generally retired, right? And they have their own concerns um, about, about age and health and being able to stay home. Um, Chinatown is a very densely populated neighborhood. There's a lot of overcrowded and subdivided apartments for economic necessity. Um, and um, not all of those setups are legal. And it means that we have folks squeezed into really tight spaces. Um, uh, so I think the, there just a tremendous amount of fear um, 
amongst folks. Um, the other thing I want to say, um, also what we're seeing, you know, it's been referenced a lot, the um, rise in anti-Asian sentiment um, and the kind of fear and tension that's creating in the neighborhood. Um, it's definitely, it is a concern. It is every single member meeting I have held since January, we have talked about this, every single one, right? And we do like at least two a week. Um, every single one, it is on everyone's minds. Um, uh, and I wanna, I wanna highlight too, it's, it's not just, you know, focused on the Chinese community. I think the unfortunate thing is that um, because of just like sheer ignorance, whether, um, uh, whether malintentioned or not, you know, a lot of other Asian communities will also be targeted um, because of anti, what is specifically anti-Chinese sentiment gets mapped onto all sorts of East Asian communities, all sorts of South Asian communities, right? Um, and then they face the, the, the dual, you know, violence of being targeted um, for hate violence and then also being erased in their actual identities and histories and backgrounds. Um, but then I think I'm also, like, we're also hearing a lot how in other countries and other areas, like, you know, it's not anti-Chinese sentiment, it's like anti-Muslim sentiment, you know, um, being used as a um, scapegoat for the crisis in India and so forth, like, I think whenever we see this type of stress in societies, right, it becomes a youth, it becomes a tool um, for those who are invested um, in hate and also in structural discrimination to, you know, kind of wedge that gap even larger, right? Um, so I think it's a, we see it as a huge issue in the Chinatown community and the larger Chinese immigrant community, but I think it's also really important um, for the Chinese community to stand in solidarity um, with other targeted communities, um, with, with um, the black and brown populations, with the South Asian populations who are being really strongly hit by COVID um, from a health and kind of like structural, um, uh, structural vulnerabilities perspective, right? Because um, if we kind of zoom out from this moment, we know how much this is part of the bigger picture. But then, okay, bringing myself back, what I wanted to say um, about anti-Asian sentiment in the neighborhood is that, again, from like January, February, this is something we were talking about on a daily basis um, with tenant members. And a lot of folks, uh, a lot of CAB members stopped working in January or February, right? Either because their restaurants closed down, because there wasn't enough business, um, because they were scared, because they're, you know, hyper folk, they get a lot of their information from mainland Chinese media and they were hyper aware of these threats long before the rest of the city was, or long before there was, you know, strong data-based reason to be concerned. Um, in early February, we strongly considered canceling one of our membership events, our, our annual Lunar New Year party, um, uh, because of coronavirus concerns. Um, and it was, you know, just a really scary time. So um, echoing what Yulina said, like, um, the Asian communities and the Chinese community, you know, folks stopped working earlier, um, folks started practicing social distancing earlier, and all of that has had cumulative health and um, economic impacts. Uh, and also, I know a lot of folks who are afraid to go to work, not for health reasons, but because they're afraid to get attacked on the street. Um, earlier this month, I had a long conversation with a member who, um, whose daughter stopped, they, they have no income, not because, you know, she has no work, but because her daughter was assaulted, um, in the subway station on the way to work. Um, this would have been like you know, mid to late March. Um, and, uh, and then she decided to stop going to work because she was scared for her personal safety, right? From a, a violence perspective, not from a health perspective. This is a, a relatively young woman. Um, so um, these are the types of concerns that we're hearing about from members. Um, Finally, I want to speak specifically to the housing and, and tenant issues that we work on um, and also um, uh, about Yulene's uh, three bills in the legislature, which we are deeply supportive of and we really want to see um, uh, the, get passed or, or other kind of other initiatives um, are calling for similar things to get passed because it's, it is fundamentally clear that we need um, rent cancellation for New York tenants, right? Um, we need relief for small landlords, right? And the, as a tenant movement, we're supporting that. Um, I think that gets overlooked a lot and this gets framed as tenants against landlords. In fact, it's, it's really not. Um, 
it's really not the, the housing justice for all and the larger tenant movement um, is, is supporting relief for small landlords. Eileen's bills obviously um, set up measures to that end. Um, and, and it's not about tenants versus landlords, especially in a neighborhood like Chinatown where small landlords are so, um, uh, so much a part of the neighborhood's um, fabric and history. Um, what it is about is addressing the most dire concerns of those who are most deeply impacted among us, right? Poor and working class people are dying the most from COVID. We know that, right? Also, one thing we know about poor and working class people in New York is that rent is almost universally their highest expense, right? And it is honestly unconscionable for the city and the state and of course the federal government to leave um, poor, poor and working class people, to leave tenants to solve, like to bear the burden of this rent crisis alone and to make those, have to make those decisions between rent and other necessities themselves, um, to be doing it alone without information, without language access, without a clear understanding of what's coming next for them, right? We have to work together um, as a community, as a society and a city to provide solutions, right? And that means doing something like rent cancellation and figuring out um, uh, more structural solutions to make sure that we can preserve and sustain housing and support the landlords who are doing that. Um, because the fact is like your average, you know, there is no one kind of tenant or, or landlord, but your average New York City landlord probably has a lot more resources to figure out how to apply for um, uh, relief and, you know, um, and, and talk their elected officials and so forth than your average tenant. So we need to really take advantage of the, the structural um, like organizations and setups that exist to be able to protect the most number of people. Um, and that's why it's really, really important to cancel rent and just um, take that burden off of individual tenants and start looking at um, broader solutions, right? Um, so um, that's, why, that's why 81 Bowery is on strike. Um, the tenants in that building leading the strike are extraordinarily brave. Um, extraordinarily clear about the moral necessity of their actions um, and we look forward to continuing to organize in the neighborhood and especially to um, bringing vital information um, uh, to the Chinese community in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much Melanie. <laughs> That was so good. And talking about language access is so important. And, you know, Rocky touched on it, you touched on it, but, um, you know, we know that our black and brown communities are hit the hardest right now because our black and brown communities are also our essential workers. <laughs> and um, our Asian American communities are our essential workers. And our, you know, communities of color are the ones who are taking the most risks at this time to make sure to keep everybody else safe. And this is why we are seeing such um, harsh numbers when it comes to to um, the percentage of uh, folks who are passing away or um, who, are, who have gotten um, sick and um, have had the hardest time recovering as well because of resources. And so I wanted to thank both of you for mentioning that and also for um, helping us to really get to um, some of the places we needed to be conversationally. Um, I wanted to bring up Carlin Cohn, who's been um, incredible, not just advocate, but also organizer on the ground for a lot of these um, different issues. Carlin, are you still there? Yes, I am. And I'm sorry, I'm having a video failure, but that means that none of you need to experience my wild quarantine hair. So, you know, we'll take the, the bright side of it. Um, so I'm Carlin Cohen, uh, pronouns they, them, or she, her, and I'm with the Chinese American Planning Council, CPC. Uh, we are a social services agency doing um, a wide variety of social services across uh, all five boroughs, but rooted in uh, Chinatown, as well as Flushing and Sunset Park. We also do policy and advocacy. So I uh, was really thrilled to join at Yulene's initial budget town hall at the beginning of the session, because a lot of the things that we were fighting for were, um, you know, exactly what is being spoken about at this town hall today. So we were fighting. We we're also um, a supporter of the Housing Justice for All Coalition. So uh, fighting for good cause eviction, universal rent control, um, more affordable and supportive housing. And then of course, housing all of our homeless community members, 
We were fighting for increased funding for social services, including senior services, uh, senior affordable housing, and other key critical social services that support uh, people of color, immigrants, low income community members. And then of course, we were also fighting for better healthcare access, particularly for immigrants, especially since the public charge rule went through on February 24th. We know that it's now more urgent than ever um, to have universal guaranteed coverage for all New Yorkers. Um, and we see that now during COVID-19 more than ever. And then lastly, of course, um, fighting for budget justice. So the assembly member, um, as well as a lot of the other elected officials on the call spoke about the importance of of taxing the rich, the ultra wealthy and corporations who are doing fine right now um, and actually raising money for all of the services that we need uh, so that we don't actually have to cut services to the communities that are being hardest hit by COVID right now. And, you know, the reason that I talk about what we were fighting for in the beginning is that I think it's really important to note that what we're seeing right now during COVID-19 is no different than the problems that we were seeing before. It's just very much amplified, right? So we already had community members that didn't have access to secure, secure housing. We already had community members that didn't have, um, as seniors, didn't have food security, didn't have access to the resources they needed. We had community members that couldn't access um, all the services that they needed. And that was already a problem that we were fighting for going into this budget season. And so now what we are seeing is that all of those systems of oppression that already existed, were already alive and well, are really just functioning through COVID-19. And something that Eulene says that I think is really important to, to amplify now is like, it's not that the systems are broken, it's that they're working exactly the way they were supposed to. So of course, we're seeing that um, Black and Latinx and people of color are being more impacted by COVID than um, white and wealthy folks. Of course, we're seeing that the people that are essential workers at the front lines of this without protection, without adequate pay, are, um, you know, people of color, immigrants, low income folks. And of course, we see that the people that are struggling to pay rent, to access food right now, to access services right now, are those communities as well. So we're just really seeing an amplification of everything that was already an issue going into this budget session. And that's why we see it as more urgent than, than ever that as we go into you know, the April 30th budget cuts and then going forth um, through the legislative session um, that we keep fighting for uh, raising revenues, that we keep fighting for canceling rent, that we keep fighting for increasing services. And I'm really grateful to Assembly Member Yu, as well as the, the other um, state electeds that are on the call today for fighting for all of those things. Um, I wanted to share some of the things that we've really been seeing on the ground, particularly around housing and senior services. If I, if I shared everything, we'd be here all day, uh, and I won't do that to you. But since we uh, went on lockdown, CPC, all social services are designated as essential, so they're still continuing. Um, but the ones that we've been able to convert to remote, we have, obviously you can't make meal delivery remote, you can't make home care remote, but we can do things like citizenship classes, adult literacy and language classes, benefits enrollment, housing support remote. Um, and we have been doing daily wellness checks with our community members um, to make sure that everybody has somebody that's checking up on them, attending to their needs, we can support them getting medications, prescriptions, um, navigate the unemployment system, whatever it might be. And just a few of the things we've seen, um, I know that the borough president already spoke about the senior meal services, um, which are definitely beginning to improve, but we're seeing food insecurity just on a huge rise among seniors. And the city really, you know, initially struggled to convert the food program, but has been working very hard at it, obviously. But as, as Eulene mentioned, we've had seniors that are either not getting food and we're having to supplement um, through donations and work like um, what Patrick is doing at Mott 46 and like CPC and other organizations getting donations and bringing them out. We've also seen seniors that didn't need food supports before needing food supports now, um, which just speaks to the growing rise across the board in food insecurity. 
And then a lot of seniors are having difficulty getting prescriptions because the drugstores that they were used to using have closed or they're scared to go outside either because they're scared of COVID-19 or they're scared of the anti-Asian discrimination that they might experience. Um, and then of course, mental health is a huge issue, not just for seniors, but obviously across the board, anybody that's facing this and the trauma that particularly the communities of color that are bearing the brunt of this is, is really significant. And I think it's important that we talk about that. Um, senior isolation has always been an issue and a concern, but even more so now um, than, than it was before. We have also in our wellness checks found that housing insecurity, which was again already a problem before, has become rampant. Um, over 50% of our community members in the wellness checks reported that they had either lost income, lost jobs, or were otherwise experiencing financial insecurity to the point that they didn't know how they were going to support their families in the coming months. Just as an example, one of our preschool classes um, has 24 children, which means that we support 24 families, right? Because it's always wraparound. You work with the entire families, not just the child. 20 out of those 24 families lost jobs or income within a two-week span of time. And less than half of those families are going to be able to be eligible for any sort of federal assistance for state unemployment insurance or anything like that. So they're being fully left out of all of the relief packages, which means that you know, these families with small children are not sure how they are going to make rent. Um, Melanie talked about the, the lack of information language access, and this really compounds in this scenario because we do have families that might think that the rent moratorium is actually means that they don't have to pay rent and might be misinformed. At the same time, we have families that don't know that there is an eviction moratorium right now and that you know, they do have rights as tenants. So something that we've been working to do is certainly know your rights um, around this and all of the other issues. And, and CAB has also been doing an amazing job at that work. Um, but the language access also cuts across everything from accessing benefits during this time to um, just proper information around like what best practices are around social distancing, access to testing and treatment, and all of those other issues. Um, and then another thing that I think is really important and urgent and cuts across these issues is that because public charge went into effect, and obviously there have been some federal exemptions around public charge because of COVID-19, but a lot of community members don't actually know their rights around public charge and they have they've been fearing that when they access housing if they're seniors and they try to access services like SNAP um, and even in the cases that they're trying to access testing and treatment we've actually seen that they have um, been scared to do so because of public charge and so that's adding another layer um, of uh, another barrier for our immigrant community members uh, so I mean all in all like I said I think that we're really just beginning to see all of these systems amplifying, all of these systems that you know have already existed just becoming much, much more clear. And you know, thank you to, to all of the other panelists for speaking. Thank you so much, Assemblymember, for continuing to fight for us. And, and we're really excited to keep fighting with you. Thank you so much, Colin. You raised like all of the points and I love it. Um, I just wanted to also um, uh, welcome Nora Moran. Um, she is uh, with um, our amazing settlement houses and neighborhood uh, houses. Sure, hi. Um, I'll keep it brief because lots of folks have already said all the things that I would say. So I'm really grateful. Um, to all the other panelists and to Assemblywoman New for hosting. Um, I always learn a lot in these town halls. So it's really, it's really fun and informative. Um, and I'm just happy to be here. Um, you know, I, I think broadly on the budget, um, it certainly was a really difficult budget. Um, lots of us were hopeful for things uh, that were not funded at the end of the day. Um, you know, we we've known for many years that our safety net in New York is funded very thinly. Um, and I think the fact that, uh, you know, we now have a, a major public health crisis is, is really um, showing just how, um, you know, underfunded some of our, our human services and other systems are. Um, on the senior services front, um, you know, we're certainly so grateful that uh, funding for the NORC program was restored. 
Um, you know, I think uh, you're exactly right that this these services are preventive and the fact that we've been able to invest and expand in them over the past couple of years has given us a little bit more of a, an infrastructure now in place to respond to uh, COVID-19. You know, we've heard from so many of the NORCs that their nurses are busier than ever. Um, you know, educating people, making phone calls, helping them understand how they can get their prescriptions, um, just helping them understand what is COVID-19, how do they keep themselves safe. Um, and I think, you know, it's certainly a very um, interesting model to look at as in the future, I think we're as a city and state going to have to really rethink um, our public health infrastructure and just how we respond to public health and how can we embed nurses and community health workers and others into um, programs where, you know, maybe they didn't have a health focus before. Um, I think it's just, it, it'll be a model I think that that we'll have to look to more seriously in the future. Um, we're also really grateful that there was funding for the Settlement House program in the budget. Um, you know, the Settlement Houses in District 65 and across the state um, have been doing incredible essential work to respond uh, in the past couple weeks. Carlin, you know, talked a lot about the work that CPC is doing, you know, organizations like CPC, the other settlement houses are, are feeding people, are trying to organize private donations, are speaking out when, you know, city and state systems have failed, um, particularly around, around hunger and around getting people food. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's just, she gave a, a small taste of the work that's happening on the ground. Um, you know, I, I think just looking forward, a thing that's super concerning for us is the fact that um, the governor does have new powers now in the budget to readjust every couple months. Um, and we already saw a reduction of $10 billion at the end of April from, from when the budget was passed in early April. And so we know now um, we have to be really vigilant over the next couple months. Our advocacy and our organizing has to continue because um, this isn't like previous years where the budget's passed and we're kind of done and can go home until next year, but we need to really um, stay focused on sort of what's coming out of Albany and, and spending moving forward. Um, and also just want to say on the point of organizing, um, uh, the census is live and, you know, it's really important for folks to be filling that out, um, particularly, you know, if we're, if we're thinking about ways to organize and to connect as communities, um, you know, filling out the census is so essential for older adults who are, are often an undercounted population, um, but for everybody. Um, we're, we're at lower uh, than we should be in New York City right now at our self-response rate. Um, so we're, you know, just putting that plug out there. I feel like I say it everywhere I go, um, but it takes 10 minutes. It's super easy and uh, helps define our next 10 years. So I'll stop there. Amazing, amazing. Um, now I want to um, ask a question. I know that uh, Brian is still here. Brian, what did he leave? He wanted to talk about it too, but um, Section 8. Um, anyways, um, let me just ask this question. I know Ellen had answered a little bit, but this is Cheryl from 10 Stanton Street. My question is, what kind of help is there for people who live in privately owned Section 8 buildings and the owners are still getting the federal help to offset the course of living while the tenants are struggling to pay rent and feel that nobody cares about them because of living in a privately owned building? Well, as I mentioned before, that is part of the Federal CARES Act that was passed on March 27th. There was specific relief. Oh, I think she froze. Oh, there she is. Uh, you froze a little bit. Yeah, you froze a little bit. All right. Um, so uh, first, uh, people have the right to have um, their rent adjusted. Um, and because and HUD has put out guidance saying that people can self-certify of loss of income if they can't get actual documentation. Second, um, there's a different moratorium. It's longer. It's better. Uh, for people who live in project-based Section 8, it goes until July. Um, and it, it, uh, uh, and it, I think, includes people not having to pay late fees um, because they weren't able to pay. Um, and then uh, third, um, if you have lost your work and if you um, get unemployment for that, the pandemic, pandemic unemployment, the six, extra $600 a week from the federal government will not be considered in calculating your rent um, for, uh, for, because it's a temporary uh, income. Um, and so when they do the interim recertifications, um, they won't count that, which would be helpful. 
Amazing. Um, and I just wanted to uh, take a quick uh, read of a comment from Trevor Holland. Thanks to all who volunteered and provide resources for some of the Section 8 affordable buildings in the Lower East Side. We would really like to see a coordinated effort to support these same buildings who are not getting PPE supplies or regular food deliveries. We will certainly take gallons of hand sanitizer as it is at that point. Um, and we will try to, so, so the gallons are very unwieldy and we will try to do our best to get some to everyone. But um, as of now, it's been, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because the state didn't even ship them to um, us yet. And so they called us to let us know that some is coming, but I don't even know when it will. And, um, and you know, it, they also told us just yesterday, the city called me to say that they had 500 cloth masks to give out for us. And I was like, that is like a package of this big and way more than I've already given uh, like way less than I've given to already every every single organization that's out there that I uh, can help to procure masks for. So I'm I'm a little bit uh, startled by the lack of um, consideration for a lot of things. But I wanted to say, uh, Trevor, I got you, and I will make sure you know to uh, talk to you after this to make sure that we get more supplies to the folks that um, are in the same situation as all of us. Um, let me uh, just ask another question that had been uh, brought up to us was. Um, basically, how uh, will the state ensure that low-income senior citizens will be able to maintain a good standard of living throughout this time? Because uh, people are, um, some, the, the, the writer was very shocked by the food options that were given. I guess, Rocky, I guess we can pinpoint that one towards you. Well, it's a very good question. And <clears throat> I think in general, the, the concern right now is the low income uh, residents and, 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 you know, not just the seniors, but, but I think the, the, the question really gets back to the budget. I think uh, we have a certain amount of safety net uh, that we're realizing is not that strong. And the SNAP program is just one program uh, Somebody else mentioned housing is another problem. You know, if people, um, I think people have to realize that. I think before this crisis, uh, there was some figure that uh, the average American had only a couple hundred dollars, like in their savings, uh, and that if there was a crisis, uh, they would use that up and they would basically have nothing. So that's shocking. And so I guess my short answer is, is we 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 need to think about obviously the seniors, but this is just the tip of the iceberg problem. We just have a maldistribution of income in this country. And, and uh, the fact that the governor has uh, kind of uh, the power right now, uh, I don't think he has the power totally. We need to make sure that we all weigh in. But I think the issue is that we need to, um, we, we need to uh, insert a very big narrative that the maldistribution of income is a problem that needs to be addressed. And that can't be done by just uh, the governor on his own, as much as he's been very good on some other issues. Uh, I don't have a specific answer. I know that ARP um, does encourage people to get involved and that if you are a member, uh, it's very easy to get involved. If you aren't a member, it's very easy to also get involved. Um, what that means, a lot of people don't realize that ARP is a big lobbying force. We have 2,000 members in New York City. We have 2 million, the state, and uh, ARP is lobbying with other groups. And so we're trying to join with uh, <clears throat> 1199 and some of the, group, some of the you know, workers who are affected in this effort to lobby uh, Albany as well as City Hall. But, but uh, the, the key thing uh, really is the federal dollars right now. You know, New York State has to balance its budget. I mean, New York City has to balance its budget. Uh, and frankly, New York State um, has, doesn't have the ability to just print money, so to speak. Um, when it comes down to it, the, 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 the short answer, I think, and the long answer is the federal government really has the ability to rearrange the allocation of resources. And we can't do it without probably a different uh, income system. And, uh, and we don't have that right now. So, so uh, I'm sure we're going to come out of this in one way or the other, but it's not going to be like the we can't go back to the old normal, otherwise we're gonna have vast portions of our population uh, in poverty. Thank you so much, Rocky. 
that's so that's not a short answer. I'm sorry. No, no, it, it, it's a very thorough one, and and uh, <laughs> we have we have a lot of work to do, is what it sounds like. So I just uh, wanted to say thank you again, and that's all uh, that I've gotten from the questions from folks. But I wanted to say thank you again. This panel was so thorough and um, so uh, amazing, and you know I wanted to acknowledge that there are many many bills right now um, that are out about. Um, social services and housing. Um, we are um, supportive of just making sure that people are getting help where we're at right now. I think that it is so important that we're discussing all of the different policy um, answers that have been suggested. I think that we need to, as a state, be able to go through and really kind of look at how our system is designed and really dismantle some of it and think about what we need to do to change um, how the um, how we failed here I guess is the, the for lack of better um, terminology but like for, for how we failed and I think that you know whether it's uh, and we'll talk about it in the health and hospitals portion for example but um, whether or not our plans to uh, in the last 10 years to have shed hospital beds was the answer. I don't know. I, I personally think that if, if this uh, pandemic happened 10 years ago, before we shed a lot of the hospital beds, we would have been in a different situation. And I think that, you know, we need to kind of think ahead of, um, ahead of time and, and do some advanced planning. And um, more than anything, I think that uh, like our panelists have said, um, you know, uh, you know, like our like our panelists have said, you know, we are able to, um, you know, uh, really recognize that that housing is healthcare, and that our um, social service safety net is very very important. So wanted to say thank you. Um, also, I think that Felicia Gordon wanted to speak, so and she wanted to ask a question, and so she want she didn't want to type it, so I'm going to allow her to ask the question. Felicia, Felicia, are you there? Hello. Hey, Felicia. Hi, everyone. Happy Sunday. Yes, no, not people are allowed to talk. It's just really about making sure that um, we keep things to a timely manner. We're about to switch. No, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I get it. Ask your Don't question. be long winded, Felicia. I no, get no. it. Ask your question. Ask your question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, for those. Those of you that aren't aware, I am a NYCHA resident association president, mm -hmm. um, and the chair is actually texting me now. Um, and obviously, I have several concerns being a NYCHA resident. Several of you have brought up very pertinent concerns. Um, you, there's been a lot of message, a lot of uh, mentioning about the disparity, disparity, right, and and races and. Uh, the inequity as far as um, financial stability is concerned, right? Um, and there was a lot of mention about NYCHA. NYCHA is always frequently mentioned. Uh, I see Gail Brewer is no longer here, but in the beginning of March, I reached out to Gail Brewer along with some of my other um, elected officials uh, with my concerns uh, regarding NYCHA being an incubator for the lack, lack of a better words for this virus. Um, I've had several meetings in regards to the funding. When I first called into this Zoom conference, you guys were talking about how the feds didn't allocate any funding for NYCHA, uh, federal funding for NYCHA, which is insane to me. Um, I just had a meeting on Thursday that the chair was involved in, as well as other people, where there was mentioned that there was a $70 billion ask that they haven't necessarily got a definitive yes to, but they're hoping to get a large portion of that ask. If that is uh, allocated to NYCHA, would that remedy some of the elected officials' concerns? Some of them. So the bill that you're referencing is the bill that Media Velasquez is uh, is the sponsor of, and I believe that you know this is the, the the funding is for public housing across the state, and I believe that if we did get that allocation, a large portion would come to New York, and that would be very 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 helpful, of course, um, in in the billions of dollars that we would definitely need. Obviously, just for capital, okay, just for capital, but. Um, repairs alone. Sorry, I'm going to mute you again because there's a little bit of noise. Okay, Felicia? 
Is that right? Uh huh. Um, so um, just just from the um, the capital needs alone, um, it is already uh, you know over almost forty billion dollars. It's almost forty billion dollars just for our state alone. So we just wanted to recognize that you know this is something that is very very dire. And um, you know when when there's um, mold, hot water, heat issues, lead paint. You know these are all things that need to be and, and asbestos. <laughs> Felicia's door, <laughs> Jesus. Um, but if there's, uh, it, you know, these different issues that are happening and it's making it so that, you know, folks are actually, you know, sick staying home, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's making it so that, you know, um, the, the, the funding for NYCHA um, has to come in um, or else, you know, we're, we're finding ourselves in an even more dire situation because right now, like we were just saying, housing is healthcare and we're making it so that people can't even stay in their own homes. So I'm going to, um, it just unmute her really quickly again, Felicia. I hope that answers your question, but um, thank you for asking it. I think that it's really important that we do get that federal funding. Um, but I also feel like our state needs to also be responsible and al allocate some funding and generate revenue to make sure that the residents of our state are protected. Um, hopefully, that answers your question. Yes, that answered most of my question. I wholeheartedly agree with most of what you're saying, but I also believe that NYCHA misses out on a large stream of revenue opportunities. I mean, that's something that you and I spoke about privately. Um, that's something that should also be opened up for a further conversation. And then there was also, and I just want to mention this really quick, quickly, a mention about um, COVID-19 testing on NYCHA sites. As a NYCHA leader and resident, I'm adamantly opposed against, uh, uh, against that because I think that is a lot of times when there are dangerous situations or things that could compromise our safety and our security, we are always the ones being volunteered. To have an, un, an unmentionable amount of potential COVID-19 carriers inundate our properties when there's no real um, guarantee how this virus is spread, if it's airborne, if it's 13 feet, if it's six feet, to have hundreds of people coming onto our developments that could possibly be contagious is a concern for me. That is not something that I would welcome in my development at all. All right, thank you, Felicia. Actually, um, I actually brought that up to uh, just the other day when um, he was talking to us about uh, sites to um, NYCHA developments. I actually did bring that up um, because I felt like that was a valid concern. I felt like, you know, we should be putting things in places where, you know, testing sites where there's not as many residential area um, and, and or that we um, actually take that into consideration that it doesn't have to be traveling far. Uh, you know, we want people to have access to it. I also think that that was something that, you know, was uh, of concern to me. Um, and Brian unmuted himself, so I think he has something to say, but then I'm gonna move to the next panel. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the opportunity to jump in. Just briefly, um, you know, I agree with everything that was just said. We need, uh, as we've been fighting for a long time for a huge infusion of capital funding. Um, and, and as you leaned out, a lot of us joined, uh, you know, Congress member uh, Velasquez uh, calling for a $70 billion national pot, uh, which the New York City would get tens of billions of dollars out of. And the federal, all of the housing authorities in the country have now joined that in the context of COVID and pushed uh, HUD to uh, fight for that allocation as well. Just on, on if tenants in NYCHA, and this was asked earlier about Section 8 as well, if tenants in NYCHA or in Section 8 housing have trouble paying their rent, just remember that you are eligible to have a rent uh, adjustment downward. Uh, you're not supposed to be paying more than 30% of your income in rent. And when your income declines, you should be able to get an adjustment. NYCHA has accelerated uh, that process of, pro of, of approving those and, and adjusting the rent downward. So they are working on that. With respect to Section 8, I spoke with NYCHA just in the last couple of days. They administer about 90,000 Section 8 vouchers in New York City, and they said only 900 tenants had requested a rent adjustment so far 
uh, in March uh, and April. So that is a very, very small fraction. It is very likely there are lots of other tenants who have had reductions in income and should be eligible for a rent adjustment. So I would urge you to uh, contact uh, NYCHA or HPD if they're administering your Section 8 voucher. And if you have any trouble with that, call uh, Yulene's office or my office or one of your elected officials and we can help with that. Thank you, Brian. Um, I just want to uh, say thank you again to all our panelists for our housing and social services panel. Thanks, guys.